In this model module, we're going to look at ordered solids. And the place to start with this is to look at close packing models for spherical objects. So our learning goals are going to be to understand what those structures are if we're packing a bunch of atoms or ions into a, a confined space. Well, let's first describe the stacking problem. One might ask, how can one stack a group of spheres in the most efficient way, that is, that take up the least amount of space? So we're going to define something called the space filling efficiency, which is basically the volume of some number of spheres, n spheres, divided by the total volume that is needed to store them. The volume of a sphere of radius r is given from geometry by 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now, if we were to put this sphere into a, a cubic box, uh, now the box has sides of length 2r, we would find that the space filling efficiency of one sphere would be 0 0.51. This comes from taking the volume of the sphere, dividing by the volume of the surrounding cube, and you would find that that gives you a ratio of pi divided by 6. Now I'll mention parenthetically that 0.51 is not a very efficient uh, space filling efficiency, simply because it would take twice as much space uh, to fill, uh, to uh, store uh, some number of basketballs than the basketballs actually take up. Let's now look at what happens when we bring more than one sphere together. So uh, I'm going to skip over just doing a linear array and go right to two-dimensional arrays of spheres. And I want to figure out what is the best way to pack those together. So let's suppose we've got uh, a two-dimensional array, a two-dimensional space that we can put these spheres in. And there's two ways we can do this. We can pack them in a rectangular array. So it's like a very uh, uh, a rectangular sort of enclosure, or we can stagger the rows relative to one another. And I'm going to call this a hexagonal array. Now one of the things I want you to notice in this is that we can, in the rectangular array, each sphere is touched by four other spheres. All right, so it has a closest packing number of four. In the hexagonal array, each sphere is touched by six other spheres. So that's what gives us the idea that the hexagonal array is an inher inherently more uh, space efficient sort of array. It doesn't take up as much space to pack the same number of spheres. Now if we move to a three-dimensional array, how can we stack these two-dimensional layers to create a very efficient packing scheme? Let's start with a rectangular array. Now it would we could stack spheres directly on top of these spheres, but that would be no more efficient than the single sphere in a cubic box. So let's do something a little bit different. We'll put those spheres on the second layer directly above the holes in the first layer. All right, this will give us a little bit more efficiency. We'll call this an interleaved rectangular array. And I want to call particular attention to a place where, which was a hole in the original, uh, original layer, because that forms an octahedral site now. It, ha it is a hole that has a, a sphere above and below, if you consider a, a layer below the red layer. And then it's got four around uh, its, uh, its equator, if you will. So it forms a site, that an enclosure, that is surrounded by six atoms in an octahedral arrangement. Now if we consider the hexagonal array, two-dimensional array, again we're going to put the next layer above holes in the first layer. Okay, it's a place where they can naturally sit. It gives for a, uh, results in a closest packing arrangement. These are interleaved hexagonal arrays. Now if we look at one of the holes that was in the original uh, layer, this forms a tetrahedral site. It's surrounded by three atoms at the bottom that are red and one blue atom on top. So it forms like a little tetrahedron in there, which is fundamentally different shape than the octahedral sites that we saw in the rectangular array. We also have octahedral, octahedral sites in this. Notice that we have some of the gaps in the original layer that are not covered by spheres in the upper layer. So there are gaps in both layers. Those tend to be octahedral sites because, again, they're surrounded by six atoms, all uh, equally uh, spaced around that site. And, and one can manipulate the, the picture here to show that it is, in fact, an octahedral shape that is surrounding that hole. So it is another octahedral hole, although it's a smaller octahedral hole than the one we found in the, in the rectangular array. Now let's take a look at a third layer of these. So we're going to keep stacking above this, and we're going to keep interleaving these arrays. When we look at the rectangular array, here's the second layer that goes on, on top of the holes of the first layer. The third layer, if it goes on the holes of the second layer, it has to overlay. It has to be directly above the first layer. So we're going to have every other layer is going to be directly above 
uh, above it, uh, the other ones. And only the ones in between will be, uh, will be uh, slightly displaced from that. If we do the same for the hexagonal ray, there's actually two different ways we can do it. So the first one, I'm going to, here's the second layer that's above the holes of the first layer. The first way we can stack the third layer is to put it directly above the atoms of the first layer. So this is what it would look like. And now that they're about directly above, we can't see the first layer anymore uh, below them. With this third layer directly above the first, it forms what we call a hexagonal close-packed array. And we sometimes denote that as A, B, A, B, A, because each alternative layer, just like in the rectangular uh, packing uh, scheme, each alternative layer is directly above the one that's two below it. So the first layer and the third layer and the fifth layer and the seventh layer will all be directly above one another. The second, fourth, sixth, and so forth would be directly above. Now that's not the only way we can do this with hexagonal layers. We can, in fact, do something different. In this case, instead of putting the third layer directly above the first layer, there are other holes in the second layer that we can use to stack the third layer that are not directly above it. Those are located here, here, and here. So once again, we have a closest packing arrangement, but now the three layers are all uh, shifted relative to one another. They're displaced. So we have what uh, is called a face-centered cubic close-packed array. And it can also be denoted as ABC, ABC, because the next layer that would go on top of this would be a layer that would be directly over the first layer, the red layer. All right, both the hexagonal close-packed and the face-centered cubic close-packed are, in fact, very efficient space-filling strategies for these spheres. The space filling efficiency of the rectangular array is 0.68, which is still is better than a sphere in a cubic box. But the space filling efficiency of the hexagonal arrays are uh, 0.74. So it is the, uh, it's got a much greater space filling efficiency. And in fact, this is the best you can do for a three-dimensional space filling efficiency for a group of spheres. Now, how does this impact metals? It turns out that metals can su support many of these different packing geometries, all right? They're not confined to just one. Okay, the three most prevalent ones are the ones that we've looked at here, the hexagonal closest packed, the face-centered cubic, and the body-centered cubic, which is the same as the rectangular array with interleaved layers. All right, I've given you little abbreviations for these, HCP stands for hexagonal closest packed and face-centered cubic, or face-centered cubic. All right, so what are the metals that will fill these different kinds of arrays? Well, it turns out that cadmium, cobalt, magnesium, titanium, and zinc all fill hexagonal closest packed arrays, whereas aluminum, copper, gold, lead, and so forth, they all fill face-centered cubic arrays. So even though these metals are all basically behaving as spherical atoms, uh, for a variety of reasons, they tend to prefer different packing schemes, and these two are, are in fact, the most efficient. But there are also metals that choose a less efficient packing scheme. Iron, chromium, niobium, vanadium all uh, choose body-centered cubic packing schemes uh, for their uh, crystalline structures. So summary is that we have hexagonal and face-centered cubic that represent the most efficient ratio possible, body-centered cubic that represent a space filling efficiency of 0.68, but metals can choose either one of these in their packing schemes. And I hope uh, this will give you a good basis for now understanding uh, the next step, which is to do ionic compounds.